Chapter 26, Metacycles. 26.1, The Logic of Capital. As we have seen throughout the transportation experience, each technology faces a life cycle of birth, growth, and maturity. Birth requires innovations, growth requires learning and deployment, maturity engenders management. What moves us from one technological cycle to the next? Is there any order in this? We have broken this text into waves, overlapping chronological periods of a little more than 50 years. The general argument is that yes, there is a logic to this process. Capitalists, those providing capital, typically money, to do things, can spend more or less resources on research and innovation, or capitalists can spend those same resources on deployment, building out the system. When you have a hit technology, you spend resources to build out and deploy widely. Once diminishing returns to expansion set in, as they eventually do according to the life cycle logic, scarce capital is spent more on speculative ventures to find the next hit to generate future profits. That said, everything is contingent on events, making the world a much noisier place than idealized models might suggest. A new hit can come any time, whether or not the previous technology is fully deployed. Just because more resources are spent on innovation is no guarantee new hits will be found. It is just that the likelihood of finding a hit increases with the resources spent looking for one. Further, we talk about the technologies as if they are a single thing here, but we've already identified the building block nature. So innovation can come in small, medium, or large sized packages. For example, the railroad was a large package, cruise control is a small package. Both directed exploration as well as unexpected serendipity lead to innovations, so it is difficult to demand regular innovations on time and on budget, Moore's Law notwithstanding. We see in transportation steadily increasing maximum and average speeds over the long term, though not so much we want to attribute a law status to it. Speeds increase both within and between technologies. Modern trains are much faster than those of 1830, as were those in 1920, as shown earlier in the figure 10.2. We are not the first to observe cyclicality. There has been a long non-mainstream history in economics looking at both business cycles and long waves. Three to five years are kitchen waves, 7 to 11 years are juggler waves, 15 to 25 years are Kuznets waves, 50 to 60 years are Kondratiev waves. Given the variability in the size of waves, 5 years is 67% longer than 3 years, 25 years is 67% longer than 15 years, it is hard to say much about the regularity for many of these cycles. Many have, with good reason, asked the question, are cycles real? Kondratiev's posited cycles track those of long-term investment. As markets reached saturation, new investment in existing technologies would decline. The evidence for these is difficult to read in the macroeconomic data, but some researchers have found evidence for all kinds of cyclic activity in the economy. Perez describes the cascade of big bangs. The process begins with an innovative big bang and ends with the next, which sets off the next surge. These big bangs map to the long cycles of Kondratiev and others, and point where the techno-economic paradigm shifts include a constellation of new technologies and infrastructures. Perez, for example, dates the second wave's Big Bang, 1829, to Stevenson's rocket, the first is Arkwright's mill, 1771, the third is the Bessemer steel process, 1875, the fourth is Ford's mass production of the Model T in 1908, the fifth is the Intel integrated circuit in 1971. Since we are interested in the birthing process as well as the surge of installation and deployment following the Big Bang, we don't really believe in singular transformative transitions. Our calendar is roughly skewed to the left and centers on Perez's Big Bangs and other key events. We ignore Perez's first Big Bang as it is not transport related. In the transportation experience, Wave 1 runs from about 1790 to 1851, Wave 2 from 1844 to 1896, Wave 3 from 1890 to 1950, Wave 4 from 1939 to 1991, and Wave 5 from 1984 onward. Mensch, 1979, extends the Kondratiev 1935 model and suggests that the economy evolves through a series of intermittent innovative impulses that take the form of successive S-shaped cycles, what he calls the metamorphosing model. The model further suggests surges of basic innovations will come during the periods when stagnation is most pressing, that is, times of depression. The upper portion of 26.1 displays the long waves in the economy. Kondratiev cycles. When the economy is in the upswing, there is prosperity. That's followed by recession and depression. Finally, recovery sets in, followed by prosperity. What is the mechanism? Mensch refers to waves of innovation that trigger investment, jobs, and so on. As those technical systems begin to age, there is recession and then depression. Recovery begins as another wave of innovation begins. 
Mensch's reasoning leaves open the question, what causes waves of innovation? We argued above that it is the search for profits. The idealized model of Mensch is interesting, but much tidier than reality. Mokir discusses another possibility. Explain the obverse. Why are so many places not innovative? His thesis, which he refers to as Cardwell's Law, is that individual societies have brief bursts of technological creativity before conservative forces drag them back. In particular, prospective losers from a change in innovation will resist an attempt to suppress it. Few innovations are Pareto superior, benefiting all players. A classic example turned into a movie is Preston Tucker, whose post-World War II automobile is said to have threatened the established ways of doing business with prospective technological changes. 26.3. Emergence of a New Paradigm The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. John Maynard Keynes, 1936 Since the 1980s, a new worldview has begun to emerge. The new paradigm partly rides on the coattails of the increasing interest in the importance of innovation in technology and economic development. Nelson and Winter, 1982, provide an example of increasing interest. They refer to progress resulting from the introduction of novelties into the system. Now there are many working with these concepts. Nelson and Winter remark on many neoclassical growth models. They have enhanced our understanding of economic growth, but they go on to say, however, there is a peculiarity about the success story which we noted earlier. By the late 1950s, it had become apparent that it was impossible to explain very much of the increase in output per worker, and that had been experienced over the years in developed countries, by movements along a production function resulting from increases in capital and other inputs per worker, if constant returns to scale and other assumptions employed in traditional microeconomic theory were accepted. The residual was as large as that portion of total output growth explained by the growth factors of production. For the growth of output per worker, the residual was almost the whole story. The researchers working within this theory found a way to resolve this problem. Earlier, Schumpeter, 1934, and Hicks, 1932, had proposed that innovation, technical change, could be viewed as a shift in the production function. In the late 1950s, Solow's work, 1957, made this notion an intellectually respectable part of the neoclassical thinking about economic growth. In the empirical work, the residual was simply relabeled technical advance. Instead of reporting to the profession and the public that the theory explained virtually none of the experienced productivity growth, the empirical researchers reported that their finding that technical change was responsible for 80 or 85 or 75 percent of experienced productivity growth. Nelson and Winter, 1982. The last sentence focuses the present discussion. Real progress is made through technological change. Beyond economists, many have adopted that worldview. In the United States today, for example, there is widespread debate about technological competitiveness. The new paradigm also responds to unease about how well the conventional paradigm catches the broad impact of transportation development. The functions of transportation loomed large in writing about the space economy, writing that accelerated during the 1950s with the development of location theory, quantitative geography, and regional science. Let's try to be clear. The conventional paradigm view or wisdom is not being thrown out. It applies pretty well to a very short-run world with fixed production functions. It is a valuable guide to the optimal use of resources in such a world. Rather than being thrown out, it is being put in perspective. While valuable, it fails to help when trying to understand transportation or economic progress, or decline. This change in priority toward ideas that are more supportive of economic progress was sharply illustrated during conversations in connection with a USDOT policy study. A discussion participant remarked, All that is available is that views of 1960s economists and engineering economists, and they are wrong. What's really important is structural change. Wrong isn't exactly the correct word. Economists stuck in the 1960s are not wrong in the terms of their reasoning. It's that their reasoning doesn't fit the situation as we now understand it. The quote from Nelson and Winter amounts to an assertion that the conventional economics paradigm omits a lot. It doesn't say what is omitted, and it does not extend to our interest how transportation improvements fit into the modern paradigm. 26.4. Status of Production the idea displayed in figure 26.2 suggests that prior to 1900, the system was growing using a certain set of technologies. It began to shift to another set of technologies at about 1900. Associated with each is a range of development appropriate to that set. At about that same time, Anderson, 1986, proposed a similar scheme. To simplify the discussion that follows, we will use the word production as a metaphor. It stands for things that transportation influences, such as industrial production, availability of resources, consumption, and social opportunities. We need some way to catch the relation between production and the status of transportation, 
So we offer a disequilibrium paradigm as shown in figure 26.3. No time dimension is shown. We add this in the descriptive verbiage. Starting at point A, production is in equilibrium with system status. A strong nonlinearity in the improvement of the system drives production out of equilibrium at point B, and equilibrium is achieved at point C. From that point, equilibrium may shift to the northeast or the southeast. If the latter, there is another phase shift at point D. Figure 26.2 conjectures about the temporal relations between the status of a system and production. The temporal trace of the reduced costs of service is perhaps suggestive of the relations of the curve in the figure above, cost since railroad deregulation. The unit cost curve typically has a reverse J shape, as shown in figure 26.4. Cost reductions are rapid early on, and then taper. The question of mechanisms relating to the status of transportation to the status of production require two-stage analysis. First, we know that major gains in productivity, the creation of new products, the creation of new activity, and so on, have their major proximate cause in innovation. Second, we need to ask what causes, permits, innovations. A transportation explanation works very well. As Adam Smith remarked in 1776, transportation makes new resources available to the economy, enables economies of scale and scope, enlarges market areas, and is generally permissive of new activities. New activities follow from innovation. Our work on transportation technology explains the mechanism through which transportation technology changes, or in the future, can be changed. What is the mechanism that links transportation improvements to development? Knowing that development is mainly driven by technological advances, thinking centered on such advances, the view that emerged is this. We should view transportation and communications innovations as energizing innovation and technology development generally. One may think of latent innovations, that is, any point in time, there are many techniques that could bloom as usable innovations. The interactive development of transportation enables these latent innovations to be shaped for markets and to be tested in markets. Those that are successful drive a round of development. It is the burst blooming of latent innovations that accelerates development as a new transportation system begins to be deployed. We may also think of innovations that begin to appear as transportation service spreads. These are induced by the availability of new services. 26.5 Companion Innovation There's been a lot of thinking about rounds or waves or cycles of economic development. Schumpeter proposed that they are innovation-driven. Mensch identifies bursts of innovations and associates these with waves. Graham and Senge have developed some ideas about the mechanisms driving innovations. The process we imagine is this. An improvement in transportation triggers a burst of innovation. Some of these were on hold because previous transportation constrained their introduction to markets. Latent innovations. Some of these are because improved transportation permits their being imagined. Induced innovations. This creates both a constructive and destructive situation. There is structural change. The old is replaced by the new. The bursts of innovations drives development. But once the transportation improvement is about half deployed, there is a development downturn. Graham and Senge provide one explanation for such a downturn. We would add that the slowing of productivity gains from the transportation improvement plays a role. A pent-up market for a new system and the increasing dysfunctions of the existing one trigger new transportation services in a new wave of economic development. We associate some innovations with transportation development. We do not claim, of course, that the transportation steers all technological progress. There have been waves of chemical industry and electrical developments, for example, that only loosely relate to transportation. Still, improved transportation technologies enhance services, enabling people and things to move more easily, while communications increase. Consumers benefit from more choices and more information about those choices. Consumers also gain opportunities to pursue other activities such as recreation. Producers can replace low-grade inputs with higher quality resources as transportation increases the size of input markets. Increases in the geographical scale of markets enables reorganization of business practices to achieve economies of scale. As Adam Smith noted in 1776, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. As the market expands, division of labor specialization increases. More market niches are created and more specialized tools and material for production are created. This specialization of production enables and even requires innovation in the technology used to exploit these new niches. These companion innovations result from innovative actions spurred by transportation development. Further, as transportation and communication technologies are deployed, ideas diffuse across networks more and more rapidly. 
ideas that once took weeks to cross the Atlantic and years to take hold, now take seconds to cross and days or hours to take hold. The process generalized in figure 26.5 has been repeated numerous times throughout the transportation experience. The canal era, the road and wagon era, the ocean liner era, the railroad era, the automobile era, and the air travel era, along with associated communication innovations, semaphore, telegraph, telephone, television, internet, have led to radical changes in politics, warfare, capital accumulation, and culture, as well as changing the natural environment in which human society is embedded. Transportation and communication advances not only enable us to do old things faster, which is adequately captured in consumer surplus and land value measures, but also enables us to do old things in new ways, and more important, to do new things. But this is only true of real advances, those that shrink the real and perceived distances across space. How does the companion innovation concept enter the debate about transportation externalities? The literature on the external effects of transportation investment concentrates on negative externalities because, as Verhoff puts it, in the case of highways, we are not able to detect any significant external benefits of road transportation. The presumption seems to be that positive benefits are internalized, say, in wage rates or tariffs for service. The companion innovation concept says that the no significant external benefit conclusion is incorrect. The provision of transportation services triggers new technology development and improved productivity throughout the economy. Wilkie comments that the usual treatment of externalities is static in character and that one has to consider the dynamics of change in order to imagine external benefits. We agree. We would also point out that innovation is an externality in the same way that noise or air pollution is. No market is made for the output. Though innovators try to capture profits with patents, likely they cannot capture all the gains of their innovation. 26.6. Thrusts for World Power How does transportation development influence nations attaining world power? The question is posed for several reasons. For one thing, we observe that the transportation experience can be discussed rather effectively without much reference to the great social and political changes taking place as the experience unfolded. There were great social and political changes from, say, 1600 through the middle of the 19th century, but as we examine the transportation experience during that period, the changes were more in the background than up front in the story. The question, how did changes in the socio-political milieu affect transportation, seemed to require no special attention. Broad brush background statements would do. There is also the question of the reverse causality. How did transportation development affect social and political changes? Some results of the transportation development were the specialization of production, increases in the tools of production, income and wealth, and changes in the holding of wealth, conflicts among social classes and institutions, and adjustments of political power, and more. While the subject is vast, we limit ourselves to a discussion of an attaining world power version of the question and subject. Modelsky and Thompson, 1996, date the modern world from about 1500, but point out that it was prefaced by a considerable period of gestation, starting at about year 1000. During that 500-year period, population doubled in both China and Europe, and there was much technology transfer from China to Europe. This dating is similar to that used in our discussion of the emergence of the modern world. There was growth of cities, coastal road and river transport, and trade in Western Europe prior to the circa 1600 date we used to mark the emergence of the modern world. In this model, the first cycle of world power begins in the 1400s and 1500s when the Portuguese designed and built new types of ships and began to explore the Atlantic and then more widely. This was a sea development cycle, a cycle having to do with ship designs, exploration, and the exploitation of native populations, church influence, and world power based on ship transportation. Both the Iberian countries of Spain and Portugal and the northern Italian city-states of Venice and Genoa made thrusts for world power. The Kondratiev cycle, or K-waves, allow us to organize our understanding of history. Kondratiev proposed long waves of about 50 years that track with the birth, growth, and maturity of clusters of major technologies, our S-curves. Historians and historiographers who analyze these things suggest K-waves dating back to the North Song Dynasty of China, dominated by leading sectors. Some embed these waves within even longer cycles of about 100 years. During each long cycle, there is a dominant world power where the world is defined initially as Eurasian. Rather than discuss subsequent cycles, the table shows one interpretation of these cycles. One would think that transportation developments would affect the capture and loss of world power. Transportation developments would affect the tools for attaining power and the loci where power is held. The challenge now is to say something insightful that links the information in the table to what we know about transportation development. One can divide transportation developments into sea development and land development. 
In the early days, sea transportation was the tool for world power, Portugal, Spain, northern Italy. The landside consolidation of power was not so much transportation enabled, it turned on the exertion of power by the nobility, the emerging trading classes, and the church. The importance of land transportation in securing a power base began to be important in the Netherlands in the early 1600s and in subsequent struggles for power on the continent. An exceptional situation was Britain won in the early 1700s, for at that time, the internal transportation system in Britain didn't amount to much compared to, say, France. With that exception, it appears that the requisite for a power base increasingly became a strong integrated economy and the transportation that goes with it. The world reach of sea power was an extension of that power base. With respect to establishing a land power base, the land powers of Europe, Spain, France, and later Germany, were preoccupied with controlling the land mass of Europe. The United States and England were not so concerned with land power challenges, they were on the peripheries. They devoted their energies to the global system and at a global scale. That was the case for England beginning in the early 1800s. The United States wasn't concerned with global power until the Spanish-American War of 1898. Challenges for power on the European land mass continued to the end of the Cold War, with some extension in the various Balkan Wars of the 1990s. We also see the continued emergence of power on the peripheries. For example, Arabia and the Persian Gulf, Japan offers a partial illustration of the latter. By about 1900, Japan had emerged as a power on the periphery. It first made local-scale challenges to Russia around 1900, then China in the 1930s, for power on land. Its world-scale power challenge was in the 1940s. Today, Japan's power challenge is economic rather than military, and is viewed on the decline compared with China. Each successive successful world power has been larger, more powerful, wealthier, and so on than those that went before, just as the critical global wars have increased in scope. Also, in each phase, the management of world power involved more complicated strategic associations with partners, and thus management relations. 26.7. Transportation and Economic Development. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. The statement, a largely discredited theory of biology, implies that when developing from an immature to mature state, an organism goes through stages reflecting the evolutionary development of its ancestors. In transportation and economic development, it would imply that before developing electric trains, a new country would deploy steam trains, or before deploying wireless, a country would need landlines. Fortunately, we can technologically short-circuit deployment so that evolution need not recapitulate in development. Still, there is a sense that at least some paths m must be retraced. When looking at rapid developing China, for instance, we see motorization in the construction of massive new highways to emulate more developed countries, rather than forging a new path. We understand how an observer in a nation might compare their area with, say, Switzerland and conclude, we are less developed when the states of transportation, nutrition, education, national income, and other things are compared. Such conclusions may seem straightforward in the point of departure for discussions and analysis. Even so, we think that such comparisons in developed, less developed language confuses the issue. For one thing, all nations, regions, and smaller areas are developed, given their historic paths, natural resource endowments, the tools available, and other attributes, including cultural and aspirational differences. The perspective from which we make that statement is this. It is a Euro-centered judgment. All nations have been touched by developments in Europe since the year 1600 and have been developing. 400 years later, we say all are developed. They are certainly quite different from what they were in the year 1600. Critics would be quick to point out that current status leaves much to be desired, given the attributes of undeveloped nations. A development status could be achieved that is closer to the status of Switzerland. Therefore, such nations are less developed than they could and should be. Reasoning more or less like that, world-scale organizations such as the World Bank, regional investment organizations, and individual nations have undertaken the stimulation of development. Essentially, the effort has been to provide attributes of capital, know-how, and services, such as educational and health services, that is, provide the infrastructure for development. Although agency records suggest that development efforts have been successful, nations identified as less developed are better off with development efforts than they would have been without the efforts. That's a value-laden and contested judgment. Hirschman uses the word trespassing to summarize the argument. He points out that governments have been destabilized, old ways of life changed, and so on. Demand has been stimulated more than production and balance of payments worsened. It is also pointed out that the gap between the developed and the less developed has increased. Within regions and nations, the equity impacts of development have been questioned. We said that all places are developed given their historic paths, natural resource endowments, tools, and other attributes. Agencies promoting development take historic paths and natural resource endowments are givens. 
Development efforts have focused on tools as instruments to build on those givens. Transportation has been considered as a tool for economic development, and it has loomed large in development assistance activities. We have five things to say about the transportation tool. First, the waves of transportation and communication development that we have examined, rail, transit, autos, air, and so on, were not just played out in the developed nations. Once the technology was standardized, they were deployed everywhere feasible. Encoded in standards, institutional formats, and equipment, know-how was readily transferred. Capital was quite mobile. So, for example, the round of rapid railroad deployment beginning about 18 1840 was a worldwide round. Recall that Stevenson's son, John, worked in South America for a time before joining his father's locomotive manufacturing business. Theodore Vail worked in South America building transit systems before being recalled to head AT&T. So if we had been involved at the time when development programs for the less developed countries were created, we might have argued that transportation should not be a centerpiece of development programs. We would have argued that transportation had already been tried. Those trials have resulted in a facade or layer of development. That's it. Not much more is to be expected. We would not have taken that position as an absolute, for surely distortions in the delivery system left unmet needs for investment, institution building, and other items. Second, discussing transportation and production, we would have made much of ways of production opportunities unfolded with the dynamics of system deployment and development. Today's systems fit the production opportunities at places where they were birthed, rapidly installed, and extensively deployed. The less developed nations didn't participate in that development very much because the systems didn't fit their situations. Suppose we have made too much of the didn't fit reasoning. Deployment wasn't tried hard enough, or constraints now removed thwarted deployment and or other things have changed. But even if we improve transportation in an LDC, that wouldn't be enough to induce development. The competitive developed nations might no longer have transportation advantages, but advantages such as agglomeration economies would still be held. Third, if we had been critics of development, we would have objected to projects oriented to decreasing costs of providing services that worked well for the production complexes of the developed nations. Rather, we would have argued that priority should go to finding the services that matched latent production complexes in the less developed nations. We would have been very much critics of the use of transportation to stimulate demand and therefore increase the rate of growth of GDP. Fourth, recall also there is a historic path dependence working within transportation. The transportation systems we have are not the best of all possible systems. They represent designs that worked at the time they were innovative and that were subsequently locked in by custom economies of scale and standards. The fourth thing that we would have done would be to point out that the transportation system exported to the LDCs are foreign in both space and time. They are suited to the resources and factor prices of the LDCs only to the extent that they are similar to those of the United States and Europe. System designs reflect know-how of the times when systems were birthed rather than modern know-how though modern know-how has been used to improve systems. Also, the systems are cursed by many dysfunctions. If one insists on further deploying those systems, they should be cleaned of dysfunctions prior to deployment. Fifth, observing that the production impacts of today's transportation modes in the LDCs are bound to be limited because the system technologies don't fit the situations, we see the LDCs needing processes of both transportation and production innovation directed to their production possibilities. By production possibilities, we mean possibilities defined on the resources and conditions of the LDCs. The powerful lure of imitation has directed attention from innovations. Excuses claiming capital shortages were offered. An excuse rather than a reason for successful systems create the capital necessary to grow. Possible counterexamples to our view are the East Asian experiences since 1960. Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea are in the developed category now. In these cases, there has been production expansion with transportation development mainly following. See, for instance, the discussion of high-speed rail in Japan in Chapter 28. Actually, of course, sharp changes in bulk, neo-bulk, and container maritime transport were quite supportive of developments in Asia. But land transportation followed rather than stimulated. Considering those developments, low labor factor prices helped at first. Also, the Japanese read Schumpeter after World War II. The first two English-language economics books translated into Japanese were Schumpeter's the Japanese learned the importance of Schumpeter's 1934, Gales of Creative Destruction, and Carrying Out of New Combinations, as the edge of competitiveness and economic growth. They were also sensitive to the achievement of scale economies and economies of agglomeration. 26.8. Discussion We can think of transportation providing a social contract with society. When there are strains on the social contract, government policy may be forged to ease the strains. We must deal with the substance of expectations. The question is, 
What does the transportation side of the contract say? What is transportation supposed to do for society? To summarize, transportation enables thrust for state or world power. For instance, the Transcontinental Railroad of the 1800s in the United States and roads in France in the 1700s consolidated state power. With respect to world power, improved ships and navigation techniques enabled Iberian conquest beginning in the 1400s. Dutch efforts in the 1600s and English economists beginning in the 1700s. Transportation makes for more efficient production in a production function context. Transportation changes the comparative advantage of places. The mechanism here is land, transportation rent. As land rents change, spatial patterns of production and consumption change. It changes relative accessibility. Transportation brings new resources into the economy. That is, market and supply areas are increased. It increases absolute accessibility. Transportation enables specialization of production and consumption, consequence of larger supply and market areas, which opens opportunities for innovation and productivity improvements. To the extent that our ideas about the emerging evolutionary paradigm are correct, they directly confront conventional wisdom about transportation management. We invest and control transportation to lower costs and or improve services. The focus is on making existing systems work better. One cannot deny the value of making systems work better, for efficiency is always desirable. Considering the maturity of systems, however, one should not be optimistic about the gains to be achieved. What's the confrontation? Is that conventional wisdom leads us to do things that are not very important. Major technological improvements are important and should be sought. Activities resulting from conventional wisdom are costly. The opportunity cost of doing this rather than that may be great. As conventional wisdom tells us, for instance, we could improve services by introducing ramp meters and advanced traffic management systems on some highways. That would take a lot of effort. Perhaps that effort would be better spent seeking new technology and services or enacting new policies. One might claim that conventional procedures are satisfactory. After all, concern with elasticity of demand will focus attention on new things waiting to be birthed. Unfortunately, that is not true. Concern is with what can be seen and measured. Conventional procedures tend to favor the old and block the new. There are many other implications. Of special interest is the developing regions or nations problem. They have invested in conventional systems to catch up. That is merit, for it allows those areas to participate in the current round of development. Even so, that strategy can be questioned. For those areas that developed earlier have the lead in development. The developing world must run faster and faster just to keep up. Perhaps it would be better to pursue an alternative path rather than copying the well-worn path of the developed world. That might provide an opportunity to surpass rather than merely catch the developed world.